Good morning. These guys have to go to the prison ministries. We pray that they have safe travels, that God will bless you, and God will use you in your ministry there. Jeremiah 31.3, it's Carl Red. I want you to look at this verse, and I want you really to think about it. The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you. With what kind of love? An everlasting. How many times in this life have human beings pledged their love to somebody else and promised to love them forever and that that hasn't lasted? That God in Jeremiah promises that He has loved us with an everlasting love. You know what the difference between our love and God's love is? The difference is, is that we have the capacity to love, but God is love. Understand the difference between those two things? No. We can love, but God is love. It is who and what He is. It is His character. So when God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love, what that means is that when God looks at you and God sees you, he sees you with that love. That you are of such value to Him that there is nothing that He wouldn't give up to have you with Him. I want you to think about that. Because what was it that God actually gave up so that you and I could be saved? Jesus. Think about this. God, we're told in 1 John, God is love. Is that right? The Bible tells us in Jeremiah that God loves us with an everlasting love. Turn with me to Exodus. Uh, this is going to be Exodus chapter 34. Let's look at verse 6. You should be familiar with this chapter. Moses Ask God if he could see him. And God says, no, you can't look upon me, because if you do that, you'll die. But I'll put you in the cleft of the rock, and I'll pass by you, and you can see my glory from my backside. Now, can you imagine being Moses at that point? This is probably one of the hardest things for me, Personally, and I know that this is probably something that we all have in common. And that is trying to actually imagine and experience God in the reality. Like Moses did, he saw his glory. We can read it, but can you actually imagine that? We see these concepts that are laid out in Scripture. And sometimes they're up here, but they never make it here. And we can't see clearly just how much God actually loves us and cares for us and what He's done for us in His Son, Jesus Christ. But let's look at Exodus chapter 34. Let's look at verse 6. And the Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, what? The Lord. The Lord God. What's the next word? Merciful, Merciful and gracious. Long-suffering and abounding in what? Goodness. Goodness and truth. This, brothers and sisters, is what the character of our God is. He is merciful. He is kind. And He is abounding in truth. Does God ever fib? Does God ever tell white lies? God tells the truth. So when God says to you, I have loved you with an everlasting love, what does that mean to you personally? Personally. That means that, look, I can lie to myself. I can deceive my own heart. But nothing is hid from God. And God sees me for all that I am. God loves me with an everlasting love. 
because God created me as one of his children. Those of you who have the privilege of having children, and you watch that child grow, and you instill in that child a knowledge of the living God, but you see them grow, and you see them make choices, and you see them fall away from what you taught them as a child, you know how heartbreaking that can be. Now imagine what that's like for God, who's able to see every human being from the fall of Adam to when Jesus comes. All of the pain, all the bad choices, all the suffering. And God has not shut them out, but with open arms, He wants to embrace all of His children. Amen. The title of this message today is God's Love for You. The last message that I preached was the power of the cross. Then I preached fall in love with Jesus. What I want you to see here is I'm laying a foundation to get you to see why you should actually love God. Why you should want to obey Him. Not why you should, but why you want to obey Him. Because listen, brothers and sisters, if this is not a motivation that comes from the heart, if you don't love God from a pure motive, then your religion is going to be based on works. And there's no profit in it. Do you guys understand that? Amen. No profit in it at all. The saddest, the saddest thing that any human ears will ever hear will be God himself saying, depart from me because I never knew you. Can you imagine going through this whole life thinking that you and God are good? That you have a relationship that's saving with him and you find out on that day that you're in the wrong line? And you hear those words, I never knew you? Why is it important for us to know what the scripture said? That wasn't rhetorical. It teaches about God. Okay? It teaches about God. Why is that important for my day to day? Listen, the majority of my life is spent working. I spend more time working, and I spend more time with employees than I spend with my own wife and children. So what does the Word of God have to do with me cutting grass every day? Ray, you spend a lot of time driving your truck. Is that right? So what does the Word of God have to do with you driving a truck? teaches me to love my brother, it teaches me the, the, the way I carry myself and what I need, because I, I'm ultimately driving his truck. It's not there you go. Anything. There you go. See, we, especially in Western culture, are very good at compartmentalizing everything. And the problem with the church today is we have compartmentalized our religious service to God. This is what I do on one day in the weekend. Whether it's Sabbath or Sunday. That's the day I go to the church. But Monday, I'm back at work. Or I'm doing this or I'm doing that. Listen. We are children of God. And if you are a child of God, then you are an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Do you know what an ambassador does? What's, in, what's the job of an ambassador? He represents, represents another country. But we're secret agents. We're not in that. So you represent Jesus Christ and His kingdom here on this earth. Is that right? So this is why God allows you to spend so much time working. Because you're going to meet all kinds of people. And in that interaction between you and all those people you meet, you are supposed to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. To let them know how much God loves them. But listen, how are they ever going to believe that God loves them when you, as their ambassador, don't show that you love anybody. Right? So what I want you to understand, and this has to be the basis for your entire being, is how much God loves you. What was given to you in the gift of Jesus Christ. What you have access to with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That when you catch a vision of this, 
What does the Bible say when there is no vision? What happens to his people? You have to have a vision of God. You have to have a vision of Jesus Christ, of who he is, of the power that he has, the reality of him in your life so that you can be effective ambassadors for him. Secret agents. I don't like that term. I don't want to be a secret agent for Christ. I want to be an open agent for Jesus Christ. I want the world to be able to see in me, not me, but Christ in me. 30 some years of walking in faith with Christ, what I've learned is I have to die daily. That this flesh is worth nothing but to be crucified. Crucified with Christ so that he can live in me Amen. and through me. So Moses wanted to see God's glory and God shows him his glory and God... If you were to ask God, show me your glory, and God did to you what he did to Moses, doesn't that strike you as funny? That Moses says, show me your glory, and he puts him in a rock, and he lets him see the backside of him. And what does Moses hear? He hears the character traits of God. Because this isn't what God does. This is who God is. Amen. You understand? Amen. Now, if any of you read the papers or watch the news, you find out that Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie are getting a divorce. Right? all over the magazines when you check out uh, in the supermarket. Now you know, on the day they got married, they pledged their love for each other, and they thought that they would love each other for how long? Forever. How long did it last? How many people do you know personally got married, pledged their love forever, swore to God that I will be faithful and true, and somehow it didn't work out? That's the difference between human love and God's love. God has sworn an everlasting love to you, and it will never fail. It will never end. Do you realize that God never has a bad day where he looks at you and goes, I've had enough of you. He never has so much on his plate that he gets so frustrated that he just says, leave me alone. God's love is enduring. His mercy is forever, and His loving kindness is to all of His children. And He wants us to understand that through experience, so that we can show it to the world. As we learned in our Sabbath school class this morning, when we understand that, when we have this experience with God's love, and we are able to show it to the world, then the world, thank you young lady, I appreciate that. Then the world will see the truth as it is in Jesus Christ. That God is real. That Jesus is true. That He is the way, the truth, and the life. But more than that, the world will be finally able to accept that there is no other way to the Father except through Him. Amen. Now, I don't need to turn here, and neither do you yeah. know this text by heart. John 3.16. Ray, what does it say? Do you know? God so loved the world that he gave his So you know this text. When you, when you think about this text, are there conditions set forth in this text? Absolutely. What's the condition? Belief. For God so what? Love. Love the world that He gave His only begotten Son. There's no, there's no condition on that. Is there? No. The condition doesn't come in there. So what that's telling you is that God loves the world. And that's everybody in the world. Does that mean that everybody will be saved? No. Here's where the condition comes in. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that, here's the condition, whosoever what? <laughs> believes in Him. Why is it important that we have to believe in Jesus Christ? Why is Christ the only way? 
Because, listen, when I was studying Eastern philosophy, there were thousands of ways. And to say there was only one way, that was really narrow-minded. But I started reading the Bible and I read Christ's own words and he said, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life. Why does it have to be that way? Do you know? I'm going to tell you, brothers and sisters, what you said is right. He is the only way. Why? Because sin had to be paid for. When you work, and you've made a contract with whoever you're working for, and they're going to pay you. When you work, is it still those people's money, or is it your money? It's not my money. It's yours, right? So listen, Paul says, the what of sin is death. Mm. So when you sin, you earn something. You know what you earn? You earn death. So there's a penalty that had to be taken care of. Why is Christ the only way to God and through salvation? Because Christ is the only one who paid that penalty. No other religion, no other human being, not even angels, could pay the penalty that we owe to God for our sin debt. Amen. But God in His love sent us His Son so that we can be reconciled because Christ not only paid the debt for me and for Ray and for Bob, but He paid the debt for all the sin in all the world, for all humanity, for all time. I want you to think about that. Just think about your own life and how much sin you've committed. <clears throat> Pay for it. You owe nothing. Then take the sin of just your family and your extended family. Now think of the entire world. Now do you think God's grace truly abounds? Absolutely. I want you to understand this because this has everything to do with the love of God. The debt that we owe to God when we sin, and that's one sin, the debt that we owe to God in our sin, in this condition of sin, is a debt that human beings can never repay. This is why salvation by works can never work. Because you can never work hard enough, long enough, or good enough to pay God back for what you owe Him. This is why God had to actually step in and God made the way. And God made the plan. And God paid the debt. How many of you have ever actually done a study on crucifixion? Do you know how long the average person who was crucified lived? Was it hours? No. Three days. It was a long time. Did the Romans invent crucifixion? And the answer is no. Uh, the Persians were doing crucifixion. The Romans perfected it. Okay? Are you familiar with our English word excruciating? Yes. Did you know that the root of that comes from crucifixion? Now listen, I, I am no English teacher. I'm just repeating to you what I've studied in the best way that I can. But I want you to grasp this and understand this. When Jesus was crucified, there were two other people crucified on his left and on his right. Is that correct? Right. How long was Jesus on that cross before he died? It was a matter of hours, right? Hours. Nobody died on the cross in three hours. Do you know how you actually died from being crucified? Okay. When you were crucified, yes, Ray, you died from asphyxiation, suffocation. You did not die from loss of blood. Now listen, I want you to understand this. They whipped you before they put you on the cross. So they opened up your backside, and then nailed you there, and you didn't die from blood loss. Do you realize that when I told you that the Romans 
effective crucifixion. That they knew exactly where to place the nails to where they didn't hit any major arteries, but they would hit a nerve. And when they put the nail in your feet, same thing. They didn't hit any major arteries, but they would hit a nerve. How you had to survive on the cross is you were hunched over, which compressed your lungs. To take a breath, you had to put your weight on your hands and your feet and lift yourself up. So every time you did that, the nail that hit that nerve in both hands and feet, when you raised yourself up, the pain was excruciating. Crucifixion. But you can last for days. Days. Now, do you remember the story in Scripture that you got to love the, the, the Pharisees and the leaders of the Sanhedrin? They condemned Jesus for being a Sabbath breaker. And they condemned him for blasphemy because he said he was the Son of God. And they murdered him and put him on a cross, but they wanted to keep the Sabbath and they didn't want these guys hanging there during the Sabbath hours. So what did they have the Roman soldiers do? They told him to go out and break the knees of all three of them hanging on the cross to hasten their death so that they'd be done before the Sabbath hours came up. Do you understand just how deceitful and how sinful sin really is? These men thought that they were doing the right thing. They thought that their religion was good enough to save them. When their own Messiah came, who their world was built around, they killed him. So why did they send these guys out to break the knees of all three of the men on the cross? It was to hasten death. But when they came to Jesus, what did they find? That he was dead already. And they couldn't believe that he was dead, so one of the Roman soldiers took a spear and did what? And Dr. Luke gives us his account and says, when they pierced his side, what came out? Water and blood. Now, why did the doctor tell us that water and blood came out? Was there significance in that? Yes. What did that mean? Right. His heart blew up. You understand? His heart exploded. When Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why did he say those things? <laughs> Because he took my sin, and I know my sin, and I know how grievous it is, and how much it hurt other people. You children, I shared a little story with my own brother. That was my brother. Now imagine what I was like to other people. I know the pain that I can cause. And when I finally understood, that is what... I did. It caused his death. It was what my sin, the penalty for that, that the only way that I could be saved was for Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to die. I got a glimpse of God's love for me. I don't know why he loved me. I still don't know why he loves me. But I'm finding out I don't have to know the answer to that. What I need to know is that he loves me. 30-some years of walking in faith with Christ, what I have learned is that the more I learn about the Bible, the more I learn about God, the more I learn about religious things, the more questions that I have. And the deeper the questions are. So now I have to watch about some types of questions that I ask and who I ask them to because I don't want to hurt somebody else's walk with Christ. I can only imagine what kind of questions you have. But you know what I found? I found the answer to every question that I've ever had. And you know what that answer is? It's the cross of Jesus Christ. So listen, I have to ask myself, whenever I talk to Lester, why is his 10-year-old daughter going through such pain, going through such trial? Why is Lester and Nicole having to deal with this and their faith in God is so strong? And the cross answers that question. The cross shows me that God loves me. The cross shows me that God loves me so much 
that he was willing to give his own son to die for me. <clears throat> the cross shows me just how sinful sin really is and that it affects the innocent. You guys understand that, right? <clears throat> Let me ask you a question here. You're familiar with the story in the Old Testament when God said that my judgment is going to come upon Jerusalem and an army is going to come and it's going to lay waste the city. How many times did that happen in the history of Jerusalem? You know there was the big story. There was the Assyrians, is that right? There was the Babylonians and then finally there was the Romans. Did God have any good people that were in the city at that time? Listen. God gave a message to the prophet. And the prophet said, this is what's going to happen. And the prophet understood that an army is coming and destruction is sure. Did the prophet pack his bags and leave? When the armies marched, where was the prophet at? was right there. So listen, you need to understand this. This is a foundational principle of Christianity. God never promises you a pain-free life. God never promises you a disease-free life. God never promises you an easy life. What God promises you is that you will experience life. And you will experience all of life. And you can experience either with Him or without Him. We all deal with pain. We all deal with tragedy. The difference is, do you want to deal with it by yourself? Do you want to deal with it with no hope? Or do you want to deal with it with hope? Do you want to deal with it with a power that is beyond you? With a power that is able to see you through, all the way through to the end. Now how many of you have actually studied about last day events? Raise your hand. They sound good? They sound like days you want to look forward to? You know what I found? I found that the men and the women who actually had a really close, deep relationship to Jesus Christ looked forward to those days. Because that is what we're here for. To see Jesus come and to finally put an end to all of this. Amen. John said at the end of the book of Revelation, Even so, Lord Jesus, what? Come. Come. The problem we have is that we're afraid. We don't want to deal with those days. We don't want to deal with that time of trouble. We want Jesus to come, but yet we're afraid that if He comes, He may not be strong enough to make it. Listen. Who is it that gives you the strength? You or Him? If He promises you that He loves you with an everlasting love that never changes, that's not, that's not like the waves of the ocean that doesn't change by what's blowing in the breeze. If He promises you that He will love you forever, don't you think He has enough power to bring you through to the end? Amen. What it, was it that we heard in our Sabbath school class today? That <laughs> God parted the Red Sea. God destroyed the entire nation of Egypt. God took the entire army of Egypt and let them be swallowed up in the Red Sea. God fed the children of Israel every morning and every evening. God didn't allow their sandals or their clothes to wear out. Did God take care of them? 